personal log of Dr. Simon Rosenstein, assistant engineer to Dr. Bethany Troy, project lead on the Rip Drive Endeavor. Sunday, February 18th, 2131. All settled in. Trip from Earth was uneventful. Dr. Troy seems delightful so far, looking forward to working with her. The station itself is bigger than I expected. Dark Halo spent a lot of money on this rig. I was expecting a couple dozen researchers and half as many support staff and maintenance crew, but there must be 300 scientists on this thing, and a crew of another 300. It's big. Still don't care for the name of it, though. The Daedalus? At least it wasn't the Icarus. Still can't believe I made it. Rip Drive. This will be huge. Monday, February 19th. Last of the equipment came this morning, or last night. The night-day cycles up here are throwing me off. Still, that's what you get on the edge of the solar system. Anyway, now that the last parts for the micro-reactors are here, we can start testing tomorrow, assuming all the maintenance checks are okay. Update? Just heard the reactor is up and running. Tomorrow we'll make some history. Tuesday, February 20th. Looks like we'll be making history tomorrow. One of the micro-reactors wasn't configured correctly. Thankfully, Maurice saved us from a complete meltdown. It would have been a real nuisance to have to wait for a completely new unit to arrive. That could take weeks. Should probably send a vid packet to the family. Let them know everything is okay. A couple journalists on the station are eager to paint everything in a catastrophic light. We're safe, though. Even if the reactor suffered a complete meltdown, it's not connected to the habitation portion of the station. We also have the magnetic field that would protect against the massive fallout. It works for deflecting coronal mass ejections from the freaking sun. It can handle a little micro-reactor fallout. Stupid media. Although, in their defense, I think they're pretty bored. Wednesday, February 21st. The defective microreactor is up and running. Basic tests for the megacapacitor discharges passed with flying colors. The RIP drive unit was brought online. I hadn't seen it before the test today. They wanted to make a uh, dramatic reveal of it. Boy, did that pay off. The thing is massive. Three rings, each a good five plus kilometers in diameter, one for each of the three spatial axes. At each of the six ring junctions are the ripper arrays, which look a bit like enormous pine cones all pointed at the sphere's epicenter. The rings themselves look a, a little creepy, to be honest. They remind me of spinal columns because of their uh, segmented block construction. The tests are being run on a free-floating crate about a hundred meters off from the observation deck. Recording equipment was placed inside, consisting of multiple cameras for visible range, UV and IR spectra, audio recorders, gyroscopes, accelerometers, the whole package, and multiple clocks and timers. We want to know everything that happens to and in that box. The arrays all pointed to their cones onto the floating test box in their center. Surprisingly, there was some visual distortion around the box in the build-up to firing the drive. Wasn't expecting that. Wouldn't have thought there was anything to distort. It must be something to do with warping space-time around the epicenter creating uh, lensing effects with the starlight behind it. They announced a ripoff, and the distortions disappeared. The floating crate was exactly where it started. Kind of anticlimactic, if I'm honest, but the first experiment wasn't to try and transport it. We just wanted to see if we could rip that crate out of reality 
and paste it back in the same spot. Complicated stuff later. <laughs> but the good news? It worked. Interestingly, the sensors on the crate were all reporting as expected, except for the clocks. The ripoff happened instantaneously from our perspective, but there was a good 15 minutes of time elapsed according to the clocks in the box. Strange. Kind of the opposite of how conventional relativistic travel would work. Everything in the box during the trip was unharmed. No changes in pressure, no damage to structural integrity, and no alteration of atmospheric composition. Not that we expected it, but good to know. The cameras pointing out the portholes showed the stars before and after the ripoff, and utter blackness outside during. Makes sense. What would there be to see? If I admitted to myself, though, I was hoping for a light show. All in all, an incredible day. Humanity just sensed something outside reality for the first time in history. Some would suggested naming the crate Sputnik II, but then everyone agreed it should be called the Outbox. Thursday, February 22nd. Dark Halo split the project into two directions. Team Trebuchet will work on experiments that involve transporting the Outbox over distances and back, while Team Alchemy will run isometric rips that test the effects of exposure to extra reality on different substances, objects, and organisms. I've been assigned to Team Alchemy, which honestly is kind of what I wanted to do anyway. Trebuchet gets the rip drive unit to play with today. Meh. So far, their initial tests have been promising. The outbox was successfully transported via more than 100 meters from its starting point. It suffered minor damage after one test where the arrays were incorrectly aligned, but all has since been repaired. The elapsed time measured in the outbox during trips increased by a fraction of a second. Team Prebuchet is curious to see how much that increase will build with astronomical distances. Meanwhile, we on Alchemy have our tests planned out. First up is a series of sensitive objects. Glasses, porcelain, etc. Delicate things that could be jostled by turbulent travel. No excessive vibrations were detected in the hull of the outbox before, but we want to be thorough. After that, some organic matter. Wood, soil, various foods and medical supplies also water, especially water, to be examined for any contaminants. Living plants will follow the non-living organic material. Insects will follow the plants. Rats and apes will follow the insects. The final stage will be a human traveler. <laughs> There's currently a raffle going on in alchemy to see who will get to be the first human to travel outside of the universe. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Heard from Renee and Little Ivy this morning. I've only been gone a couple of weeks, but Ivy already looks an inch taller. <sighs> Kids. Friday, February 23rd. Today was Alchemy's day to run initial tests. The sensitive structures survived the trip without incident. That test ran so smoothly we accelerated our schedule. The non-living biomatter came next. No anomalies detected. Dr. Helen Ru Ming, our biology specialist, got to drink the water that came back after we ran tests on it. Rather her than me, but she was just fine. The plant test had some interesting results. Trial 1 was a trip of various mosses and lichens that came back with no anomalies. Trial 2 contained various blooming flowers, kept in a careful standard earth light cycle prior to the test. During the 15 minutes outside the universe, the flowers exhibited nictinasty, a word I learned today from Helen. It means their petals closed up. 
This behavior would be expected of the species used, tulips and crocuses, during the night. However, the test was run in what we carefully determined would be the middle of their day cycle. These unexpected results will give us some data to ponder over the next couple of days. The next test will be run Monday the 26th. Monday, February 26th. Team Trebuchet succeeded in transporting the outbox to a location 25 kilometers away from the Rip Drive unit's epicenter today. Then they brought it back, also using Rip Drive. They were previously able to bring it back from new locations within the volume of the large sphere, but this was the first retrieval from outside. <laughs> Exciting. Alchemy has some theories about the flowers closing up. We're wondering if the lack of cosmic rays in the outside is telling enough to disrupt the plant's day-night cycle. We're testing the theory out by putting different plants deep in the protection of the Daedalus's magnetic field generator, and more plants out in one of the station's extremities that reaches beyond the magnetic field, though not so far as to kill them. I think we might be onto something, but Helen is skeptical. Tomorrow the insects, and then the mammals. Tuesday, February 27th. Today's results were troubling. The first trip involved insects. We placed four transparent polycarbonate boxes into the outbox. One contained 12 fruit flies. The second contained, let me think, 12 butterflies. Yes, that's it. The third and fourth both had different kinds of beetles. The bugs were a little agitated before we sent them off. And when we got them back, they were buzzing and flying everywhere like crazy. We initially assumed, again, that the abrupt change in cosmic radiation and maybe even magnetic fields sent something in them haywire. Then we sent the rats. Four different boxes, again transparent, each holding a pair of female rats. The animals were quite calm when we loaded them in. I forgot how much rats will poop in a cage. Before we engaged Rip Drive, we looked at video of them in the outbox to establish a baseline for their behavior. The rats didn't seem to care for zero G, but they were making the best of it. We flipped the switch. When we opened the outbox again to retrieve them, each of the four boxes contained one living, absolutely crazed rodent and one savaged and shredded rodent corpse. I didn't know that rats could shriek like that. That sound will probably show up in my dreams tonight. We were scheduled to run the tests on the apes today, but given the rats' behavior, those have been postponed. Trebuchet gets some extra time to play with the unit while we figure out what to do about this. Oh, we also found out who won the raffle. Maurice Benson, the guy who saved the uh, micro-reactor from the meltdown. I bet he would have been a lot more excited about that before today's results. Wednesday, February 28th. The journalists know something is up. Nobody was dumb enough to tell them the experiment made the rats homicidal, thankfully, but someone left the storage section for the rats unlocked. They wandered in and saw the living rats still absolutely feral and going nuts. Helen tried to head them off by calling it space shock or something like that. It bought us time, but I don't think they believed her. Trebuchet's tests are all going swimmingly. Dark Halo sent a message congratulating them on their stellar progress. We weren't mentioned at all. They really don't want any negative publicity on this project. Alchemy is talking about running tests with more rats before we run the apes. The idea is to see if, maybe, different environmental conditions soothe the passage. Closing the display ports, for instance. Maybe the sight of absolute nothingness is different in person than over the camera. But I doubt it. The plants couldn't see, after all. Oh yeah, those tulips and crocuses haven't opened up again since the test. 
and the plants stuck in the middle of the magnetic field and sticking just barely out of it. The light cycle being maintained has them opening and closing normally. I just heard that the surviving rats from the test are dead. Cause unknown at present. On the bright side, single-celled organisms appear to be unaffected by the rips. No super viruses or new invincible diseases were created. The samples we took of microorganisms from the latest tests were all normal. I'm glad someone thought to check that, considering the other results. Thursday, March 1st. We were ordered to run the apes today. Dark Halo heard that we were stalling progress on the tests due to concern for the animal's welfare, and insisted that progress was more important than the lives of a few simians. Idiots. Those apes are the closest we'll get to simulating human travel without actually sending humans into the outside. Don't they get it? Sending those poor animals into something that we know causes homicidal mania in other mammalian species. Dr. Troy tried to buy us time, but she only managed to get things put off until tomorrow. Friday, March 2nd. Today was horrifying. We sent the apes through. They were each placed in a reinforced titanium cage one on either side of the outbox. They weren't thrilled with the cages, and even less with zero-g. Still, they were behaving like apes when we looked at the video feed from the outbox before engaging Rip Drive. When the outbox came back, they weren't running wild or crazily clawing at their bars. They were completely calm, even more so before they went through the Rip, in fact. Before we opened the outbox to retrieve them, we watched the video taken during the rip. Initially, right after the drive was engaged, the two apes did appear to panic. They howled and cried out and shook at their cage bars. After a moment or two, though, they calmed down. They looked at each other and seemed to communicate from across the room. Then they settled down, gripping the bars and waiting in silence. Based on this video, we believed that there must be some initial trauma during ripoff that our instruments cannot identify, but that life forms experience. The rats and insects were overwhelmed by it, and the flowers noticed it, but the apes, maybe due to their higher brain function, were able to weather it. We were wrong. When their handlers opened the cages, the apes attacked. They killed their handlers easily and ran around the docking bay targeting crew members and other station personnel. They worked as a team, pairing up and using the environment to their advantage to... No, I won't describe how they did it. I don't know how the custodial staff are coping. The two animals were eventually killed by security personnel, but only after 19 of Daedalus's crew were killed. Dark Halo sent an observer to mark our progress. He wanted us to run more tests, saying that the ape's behavior was inconclusive. <laughs> Dr. Troy punched him in the face and told him he was out of his mind. The Observer tried to have Dr. Troy apprehended by security, but after the ape rampage, they were firmly on our side. Alchemy is on full stop for now. Wednesday, March 7th. Trebuchet's tests have mostly finished up. They did wind up hitting a limit on how far they could send or retrieve the outbox. 50 million kilometers. For near instantaneous travel relative to the outside, and only about 20 minutes maximum duration for the travelers, not too shabby. 
they're also confident that they could go farther with different, more powerful micro-reactors. Dr. Troy has been replaced as lead researcher with Dr. Jose Philemon. He's little more than a dark halo stooge. Under him, we've been all but coerced into starting up tests again tomorrow. Becoming persona non grata with the largest branch of microstar technology is not a threat to be taken lightly. I'll give Dr. Troy this much. She was brave to stand up to them. But I would still like to have a career after this. Does that make me cowardly? I hope not. Maybe. Probably. Still. Greater good. In the long run, I can do more in this field than if I were ostracized. Have to remember that. She just lost focus. Thursday, March 8th. Helen had a brilliant idea. Transport the animals while sedated. <laughs> Even Dr. Stoogeface had to concede that it would be valuable to learn if sedatives could prevent homicidal mania. A bit. The only drawback is that the sedatives won't arrive for another week. Still, absolutely brilliant. If Dr. Troy had only thought of that... She did still punch Darkalo's observer in the face. Yeah, she was a goner either way there. Hopefully she'll find some help back on Earth. Wonder if she's there yet. Wednesday, March 14th. The sedatives arrived this morning, and we reran the rodent and ape tests with fresh subjects. The rats had a negative reaction to the sedative, something allergic, I think, but the trip did not appear to induce the same mania in them. The apes, this time a pair of orangutans, huh, I never did find out what species the first pair were. Gibbons? Chimpanzees? No, they were bigger than that. I need to ask Helen. Anyway, the orangutans came back and were absolutely fine once the sedative wore off. The handlers were more than a little apprehensive, but Ruby and Rachel, the two orangutans, were not even slightly aggressive. Maurice Benson, the guy who won the raffle to be the first to travel outside, says he wants to go through tomorrow. Since the sedatives worked on the orangutans, he figures it's safe enough for him. Some of us tried to talk him out of it, self-included, but... Dr. Philemon was all for it, and what Dark Halo Stooge wants. Thursday, March 15th. Maurice made it. He went under at 8.43 this morning. The outbox underwent ripoff at 8.53, once we were sure he was completely under and everything was in position. Once the ripoff was complete, we checked with the outbox. His vitals were good, and about 15 minutes had passed. Situation normal. We asked him what it was like when he woke up. He said he just remembered falling asleep. No terrible nightmares or strange sensations. There's a party for him in an hour. I'm going. After all this worry and stress, I need a drink. Or six. Friday, March 16th. I wish I'd never agreed to be part of this project. After the successful voyage of Maurice yesterday, Dr. Philemon insisted on trying it with a conscious human. Everyone protested. But he said the subject would be drugged, given high-strength depressants to counter the mania. That swayed enough of the others in alchemy. They wanted to see what would happen. Only Helen and I remained opposed. Maurice didn't want to go again, but they strong-armed him into it. I tried to stand up for him. They called security on me. I just watched, helpless. 
I couldn't stop them. They put him back into the outbox. He gave a weak smile before the doors closed on him. They doped him up pretty well. They fired up the rip drive. The outbox made its journey. We checked Maurice's vitals via the remote sensors the second the ripoff was done. Right before the voyage, they showed a conscious human with low heart rate and a lethargic state, as per the depressant drug. After, his levels were normal for an awake human. It was like the drug had completely left his system in that 15 minute interval. We also discovered the video feed was shot. We tried to pull the recording of the trip, but got nothing. We had to open the outbox to see him. Security personnel lined up around the outbox's door, stun guns at the ready. The doors opened, and Maurice walked out. He looked normal. He smiled and waved at everyone, asked if those were fully charged Medarev 12s they were holding, or if they were just pleased to see him. The security guards didn't lower their weapons, but we could see the tension leave their postures. We had security escort him to a holding cell for observation. Then we looked in the outbox. The cameras pointing at where Maurice was during the trip, all the visible spectrum, IR and UV cameras, were smashed. Their memory was obliterated. For some reason, Maurice destroyed all monitoring equipment we could have used to see what happened in those 15 minutes outside reality. Later, we went to interrogate Maurice. Dr. Philemon and most of the others wanted to know about the trip. Helen and I wanted to know why in blazes he wasn't almost comatose, and why the equipment was trashed. His story was simple. After ripoff started, the drug started wearing off in a few minutes. Once he felt lucid, he started seeing strange and grotesque hallucinations. He commented that was probably what happened to the animals. He also said that he was still seeing us as those same hallucinations, but that he wasn't going crazy because he kept reminding himself to stay calm and that what he was seeing wasn't real. Allegedly, the hallucinations were fading, but slowly. It took him a little while to realize this in the outbox, and by then, he had already smashed the recording equipment. Simple. I don't know how I know this, but the man we spoke with, it wasn't Maurice. The Maurice I knew was jolly, a touch awkward, clumsy, and always ready to laugh. The man we interrogated was reserved, cool, and always smiling in a way that seemed more predatory than happy. His answers were calculated and brief. The rest of Alchemy was satisfied with his explanation, but I don't believe a word he says. Neither does Helen. We insisted that he be kept under observation in the cell as a precaution. Maurice, or the thing that used to be Maurice, objected, but Dr. Philemon also seemed unnerved by him, even though the doctor was more accepting of the story. Hopefully, this buys us time to think of something. We need to shut down alchemy tests. Saturday, March 17th. I've been confined to my quarters. The guards didn't say why. The doppelganger, what I've decided to call Maurice's new status, must have gotten to Dr. Philemon. I haven't spoken with Helen, but I assume she's been put under guard as well. I've heard some rumors while listening in on my captors' conversations. It sounds like more human outbox trips are planned, without any depressants. If true, the doppelganger must be trying to bring more of its kind over. Here's what I think happened. Using Rip Drive, we reached outside of what we thought was reality. But instead, 
reached into some other universe or plane of existence. Initial tests on just the inanimate objects, the empty outbox with the sensors, and the non-living materials came back okay. But once we started sending life forms over, they met something that our equipment couldn't detect. Some kind of outside entity or entities. At first, the entities reacted with hostility, driving any living thing we sent over mad in a kind of mental attack. But we sent things over with higher brain functions, and they became curious. The entities possessed the apes we sent and came back over to see what was here. They attacked us, either because they didn't like us and what they saw, or because the apes weren't able to give them a good enough mental platform to do anything else. But Maurice, if he really is possessed, then his doppelganger understands everything he does. It must have overwhelmed his mind, taken control, and decided it wants to see what this universe is like. And now, it's bringing its friends over as well. Dr. Philemon is under the doppelganger's sway. He controls this station thoroughly. I have no allies left. Not since Helen is sequestered, too. But I have to get word out. To Dark Halo, to Microstar, to the Astronavy. They have to stop this before it spreads. Before the entities possess the rest of us. If this were to get to Earth, we would be, as a species, possibly lost. <laughs>